Hello, everybody. Today is my fifth class with you, and I'll be starting the female reproductive system today. Now, the today's learning objectives will be will be briefly knowing about the functional anatomy of female reproductive organs, and we'll mainly focus on the menstrual cycle. And we'll know about the cyclical changes which occur in different reproductive organ in females during this menstrual cycle and uh, mainly in the ovaries and the uterus and finally we'll know about some of the abnormalities of the menstrual cycle so with this learning objective let's go to the female reproductive organs we know this is a default setting that if sry gene is not present and the testis is not developed under the uh, influence of the Y chromosome, then by default, the Mullerian system develops and uh, there are two female gonads, as we know, the two ovaries on either side, which not only function as the production of ovum, that is called oogenesis, but also is the endocrine organ, that is, the gonadal hormones are being secreted from these ovaries. And this hormones are being secreted from the developed follicle around the ovum. So, ovary is the site for oogenesis, for folliculogenesis, and also for the formation of the female gonadal hormone. Then coming to the accessory sex organs, we know that there are fallopian tubes just uh, um, uh, around the ovary. There is the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube, which ultimately ends in the cornu of uterus. And it is very, very important accessory sex organ because the Fertilization occurs in this dilated part of the fallopian tube, which is known as the ampulla. And then it traverses all through the tube to get implanted into the body of the uterus. This is the uterus as such. This is the fundus. This is the body of the uterus. And we know this is the cervical canal. Cervical canal is being... Um, uh, uh, guarded by the internal os uh, in the upper part and the external os and in between there is the endo cervical canal and then there is vagina this vagina is the conduit for not only conduction of sperm which goes all through the vagina uterus and travels through the fallopian tube to uh, um, uh, reside in the ampulla for the fertilization, but also it is for uh, the parturition and giving birth to the implanted uh, embryo. Now, besides that, we see that this is the ligament of ovary, which suspends the ovary and connects it to the uterus. So these are, in brief, the female reproductive organ. The other organ is the breast, and the breast also undergoes cyclical changes with the menstrual cycle. So now coming to the menstrual cycle, this is the most important monthly event in a female reproductive life, throughout the reproductive life of a female, when different reproductive organs undergo characteristic changes teleologically in preparation for fertilization and conception. And these cyclical changes occur mainly under the influence of the HPG axis, that is the hypothalamopituitary gonadal axis, the hormone secreted from them, and it is called the menstrual cycle. So we know the hormones influencing it are the hypothalamic GnRH, the pituitary FSH and LH, and the ovarian estrogen and progesterone. 
Now, the duration of menstrual cycle is highly notorious. Average is about 28 days plus minus 4. That is from 24 to 32 days is usually the common duration of menstrual cycle, though it varies uh, highly from person to person. And the changes, as I told you, occurs in all the organs, but most markedly in the uh, uh, uterine and the uh, ovarian uh, ones. And so they are called the ovarian cycle or the uterine cycle. So the cycle can be named according to the ovulation. Now ovulation is the event in the ovary, right? So the ovulation can divide the ovarian cycle into the follicular phase and the luteal phase being interspersed by ovulation, okay? So before ovulation, the phase is follicular phase in ovary and after ovulation, it is the luteal phase. But in uterus, ovulation, although it is not really the uh, event of um, uh, uh, uterus, but it is being highly influenced by this uterine cycle, ovarian cycle. So the uterine cycle, on the other hand, pre-ovulatory is the proliferative phase and post-ovulatory is the secretory phase. And the secretory phase ends or the proliferatory phase begins after or before the period or the menstrual cycle. So uterine cycle can be divided or the endometrial cycle can be divided into the menstrual cycle. It lasts for one to five days, usually up to four days. Then the proliferative phase from four to 14 day. And actually the menses are, are often included within the proliferative phase because the proliferation soon starts. And from 14th to 28th day, this is the secretory phase of the endometrial cycle or the uterine cycle. But the ovarian cycle, we can say that can be divided into two. The first 14 days, if it's a 28 day cycle, the first 14 days is the follicular phase. In between occurs the ovulation, and then there is the luteal phase from the 14th to 28th day. So these are the phases of menstrual cycle, mainly speaking of the ovarian and the endometrial cycle. Now coming to the ovarian cycle, as I told you, the events occurring in the ovary are oogenesis, that is the development, maturation and the growth of the ovum, mature ovum from oogonia. Then follicular genesis around the ovum develops the follicle, which are mainly the hormone secreting organ of the ovary and the secretion of gonadal hormones from this follicle. And phases we have already discussed, the follicular phase, the ovulation and then the luteal phase. Now, coming to the oogenesis. Now, oogenesis occurs from the oogonia present in the ovary. Now, during birth only, the number of oogonia is fixed. That is around 2 million oogonia within the primordial follicle. And the number of this oogonia or the uh, primary uh, uh, oocytes we call is fixed that cannot be increased after birth. So the number of primary oocyte or oogonia with which a child is born is fixed. What in increases is the maturation and the development of this oocyte into ovum. So before birth only, in the prenatal life, we find that of the 2 million oogonia, only a million of it enters the mitosis, that is undergo the proliferation or division or the um, uh, increase in number. And so the primary oocytes are formed. And these primary oocytes actually are having the deployed number of cells, 2n number of cells. And some of them, not all, some of them of these primary oocytes, they are arrested in the 
prophase one of the first meiotic division. So, of the total ugonia, two million ugonia in the primordial follicle, we see that um, uh, uh, almost fifty percent undergoes atresia, and fifty percent, that is a million, actually develops into primary oocyte, which enters into the prophase one of meiosis, and it is arrested in the prophase one of the first meiotic division at birth. Then during the infancy or um, uh, childhood, there is no development of the primary oocyte. So primary oocyte arrested in prophase one of the first meiotic division continues throughout the childhood until the woman achieves its puberty. Now at the menarche, just before the ovulation, we see that this first meiotic division completes. Okay, and so one first polar body is given out, and the secondary oocyte is formed, which definitely has a haploid number of, of chromosomes. So here we see that the meiosis one is completed, the haploid number of chromosome is formed giving out the first polar body which gradually degenerates and it is uh, uh, when it enters into the second meiotic division and is arrested in metaphase 2 then it is named as secondary oocyte. So again there is a arrest by the uh, uh, oocyte maturation inhibitor factors and this occurs during just before ovulation. So at ovulation, it is the secondary oocyte which comes out of the follicle and enters into the fallopian tube, where if the uh, uh, motile uh, sperm is available for its fertilization, then only this secondary oocyte completes the second meiotic division and the second polar body is given out and the uh, ovum is generated ovum is generated but here it's showing to n because it is due to the fertilization by the sperm sperm having n number of chromosomes and the uh, 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 ovum also having n number of chromosomes so this two finally forms the 2n number of chromosome that is the zygote so after fertilization only ovum is formed soon to be fertilized by the sperm to form the zygote so this is how the oogenesis up till fertilization uh, or the fate of ovum occurs in a female reproductive cycle. Now, as I was telling you that these are the uh, um, uh, oogonia developed into the primary or the secondary oocytes. But along with this, we find that the, uh, there is development of follicle. This is known as folliculogenesis. That is, at birth, the either the oogonia or the primary oocyte is within the primordial follicle or it's also known as primary follicle. Subsequently, it develops and um, uh, the secondary uh, oocyte is uh, uh, formed uh, um, uh, subsequently, which uh, uh, develops within a matured secondary follicle. And finally, this is given out during ovulation and the, uh, the ruptured follicle now mends itself to form the corpus luteum and which finally degenerates as corpus albicans. And this secondary oocyte, which is given out at ovulation having haploid number of cells, is fertilized by the sperm when it forms the ovum. Now this follicular development has again many of phases of which in the first if it has, is a first 14 days before ovulation, then first five days is recruitment. That is not all the uh, uh, primary follicles will enter you know, to develop the uh, dominant follicles. So first five days is recruitment of two or three uh, primary follicles. And then there will be the selection. Five to seven days, two days are for the selection. And subsequently, there will be the dominance depending on certain criterias, we'll discuss it later on. 
so this is the ovarian cycle starting with a primordial follicle containing the oogonia or primary oocyte then the early primary follicle when we see that the granulosa cells are being developing will come to the follicular genesis late primary follicle this is the secondary follicle not secondary primary follicle it's a secondary follicle when we find the antral fluid is being developing and this is finally the matured graafian follicle with enough of antral fluid and the um, eccentric um, um, uh, ovum with the granulosa cells and then finally there is ovulation and this um, um, ovum along with the granulosa cells are being um, uh, uh, expelled off from the uh, mature follicle and the fate of the mature follicle is it develops into another organ which is known as the this is also endocrine organ known as the corpus luteum and this corpus luteum subsequently develops into corpus albicans now let us come to the maturation of follicle now initially the primordial follicle we see that there is a central um, oocyte which is commonly primary oocyte or oogonia developing into primary oocyte in primary oocyte as we all know that we have the Uh, uh, central um, uh, primary oocyte that is where uh, the cell has entered into the first meiotic division but is arrested at the uh, uh, prophase 1 and surrounding it there is a single layer of granulosa cell single layer of granulosa cell and uh, outside it this is the basal lamina so this is only the primordial follicle that is about 7 billion primordial follicle is present when a, a, a woman develops in the prenatal life and just before birth they undergo atresia so that only about 2 million this uh, uh, primordial follicle are being uh, uh, present and that is the number is fixed there is no more multiplicational division now what happens is the maturation of the follicle so now primary follicle will be formed where we find that yes there is the primary oocyte and surrounding primary oocyte we find a jelly like coat is formed and this jelly like coat is nothing but the zona pellucida zona pellucida which develops due to the secretion of mucopolysaccharide from the granulosa cells and outside is the granulosa cell layer single layer of granulosa cell with the basal lamina so this is the primary follicle housing the primary oocyte now then develops the secondary follicle now the secondary follicle the criteria is there is multiple layers of granulosa cells multiple layers of granulosa cells and there is development of the thecal cells thecal cells outside the basal lamina they starts developing so as the thecal cell starts developing it develops into a secondary follicle and the oocyte is primary oocyte still then and there is a jelly like coat surrounding protective mucopolysaccharide layer that is known as zona pellucida now these secondary follicles once they are uh, selected uh, uh, to be the primary uh, uh, primordial uh, sorry dominant follicle then this um, uh, granulosa cells they undergo uh, um, uh, severe multiplicational division the mitotic index becomes very high and they start secreting the antral fluid start secreting the antral fluid and the thecal cells on the other hand outside the basal lamina they differentiate into theca interna and theca externa they differentiate into theca interna and theca externa now the follicle is maturing enough to secrete enough of estrogen and there is vascularization of the from the theca interna into the uh, um, uh, granulosa cells so that the estrogen produced from the granulosa cells now can, can can come into the blood stream and as the estrogen level starts rising there is 
negative feedback to the pituitary and hypothalamus, decreasing the gonadotrophins. And this follicle, they develop under the influence of FSH. So FSH is very important for the health of the follicles. Now, once the FSH starts decreasing, then they cannot support this many number of follicles. Those follicles or one, on, one and only one follicle which uh, uh, exhibits large number of FSH and LH receptor, they can only survive. So here comes the question of the secondary or early tertiary follicle to develop into dominant follicle. So the criteria for the dominant follicle to develop will be number one, it should have a very high mitotic index. That is the uh, uh, both the thicker cells and the granulosa cells should uh, uh, proliferate uh, heavily and they should have high vascularity. Not only the uh, thicca externa interna, which has the vascular supply, but also the granulosa cells should be vascularized. And there should be increased expression of LH and FSH receptors on the granulosa cell. This criteria will decide whether a follicle will be a dominant follicle or not. Now, the dominant follicle, as it develops, we find that there is large amount of this follicular fluid follicular fluid and this separates the granulosa cells into this is called membrana granulosa which is again having two layer two uh, distinct uh, types the outermost one is called the mural uh, granulosa cells mural granulosa cells whereas the inner one these are called the antral granulosa cells the mural granulosa cells these are most active and but is farthest from the follicle whereas antral granulosa cells are facing in the antrum and secreting the fluid and the follicle has been um, uh, eccentric and being surrounded by corona radiata and the zona pellucida and it is connected to the main follicle by the cumulus oophorus or the cumulus oophorus granulosa cells. Now, this is the dominant follicle which uh, will uh, uh, now uh, go to um, uh, uh, be ovulated or mature enough to undergo ovulation. So next is, yes, this is a short slide showing how the initiation occurs, 123 months. All the follicles are developing, but they are not being uh, um, entering into the basal growth phase. So three months of basal growth phase and uh, um, uh, more than two months of, uh, sorry, initiation phase and more than two months of basal growth phase will actually allow for the selection. And once it is selected, it is the 15 days which it, uh, the maturation it undergoes before the ovulation. Now, here I want to discuss very shortly about the two cell theory. Though we'll come to the hormonal secretion of the gonad in the next class and the effect of hormone on these uh, uh, menstrual cycle. But uh, here I uh, thought it, it will be apt to discuss about the two cell theory, that is the theca cell and the granulosa cell. Now, initially, it is the thecal cells which has access to the blood vessels. Granulosa cells lying inside the basal lamina does not have direct access to the blood vessels. So the cholesterol coming from blood is initially, in initial time, it is present in the thecal cell only. So the uh, um, uh, estradiol or estrone, whatever, being formed from this cholesterol, the raw materials has to be supplied by the thecal cell. Now this undergoes the changes which we have already been known, the pregnenolone, then the 17-hydroxypregnenolone, dehydroapyandrosterone, uh, uh, then androstenedion. This androstenedion actually crosses the basement membrane into the granulosa cells. And then um, under the influence of the uh, um, 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 enzyme aromatase, the CYP19, you see estrone is formed 
and then in the presence of 17 beta uh, uh, hydrox you see uh, dehydrogenase hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase that the estradiol is formed in the granulosa cells and we can see that the granulosa cells are under the influence of fsh which is very important for the follicular development and it is acting by the cyclic amp pathway whereas the thecal cells is under the lh influence of lh which also acts by the protein kinase a so initially in the initial phases the granulosa cell has to depend on thecal cell for the raw materials for estrogen production and subsequently the, uh, this granulosa cells get vascularized and then only this estradiol can enter into the blood and can produce the negative feedback. So initially estradiol formed in the granulosa cells with the raw materials taken from thecal cells remain uh, uh, within the follicle itself cannot come into the bloodstream and helps in maturation of the follicle. But subsequently we'll see that they uh, um, come into the um, um, this cholesterol uh, is available in the granulosa cells and this is the phase when a large amount of progesterone uh, sorry estrogen is being produced uh, getting the raw materials from the thickle cell as well as from the blood directly from the cholesterol because the enzymes are present what is absent is the raw materials because it does not act, have an access to the blood for the cholesterol now once granulosa cells gets access to the uh, uh, blood and uh, we find that the, uh, they can produce the uh, huge amount of estradiol and now it is going towards the positive feedback because we know that if a huge uh, amount of estradiol more than 300 nanogram per ml if it is there in the blood for more than 48 hours it will cause a positive feedback to the uh, pituitary uh, hypothalamus gonadal axis and that will cause the LH surge and ovulation. We'll come into details of this, but just remember that the granulosa cells has to be vascularized and it has to get the raw material on one hand and has get an access to the blood to pour the estradiol, which will cause the positive feedback for the LH surge. Now then ovulation. So what is ovulation? It is a process by which the uh, mature dominant follicle, which is also known as graphene follicle, will be discharging its secondary oocyte by the time it has completed the first meiotic division at ovulation, as I have told you, just three hours before ovulation, it completes the uh, uh, first meiotic division, secondary oocyte is formed and secondary oocyte along with the zona pellucida and corona radiata is uh, expelled into the peritoneal cavity. And this is uh, occurring under the influence of LH surge, as I told you, and occurs about nine hours after the LH peak. Now, in a 20-day cycle, it is around 14 days that this um, uh, ovulation occurs. But this proliferative phase, that is the phase uh, which ends by ovulation, it is notoriously variable. Whereas the um, uh, luteal phase is rather quite fixed. Now the ovum is taken up definitely by the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube and it is only viable for 72 hours and that too uh, it can be um, uh, fertilized uh, within only 48 hours. So uh, it should be fertilized for the um, um, uh, zygote to be formed for the fertilization to occur and the embryo to be implanted in the uterus. Now, what is the mechanism by which this expulsion occurs? It's a very complex procedure. Now, uh, um, that occurs definitely uh, when there is LH surge. Along with LH surge, there is increase in uh, FSH as well. And once the corpus luteum is starts forming, progesterone is also secreted. So under the influence of LH, FSH and progesterone, there are certain changes. First is neutralization of OMI, that is the ovulation, oh, sorry, oocyte maturation inhibitors. This oocyte maturation inhibitors actually inhibit the secondary oocyte <coughs> uh, um, uh, 
primary oocyte in the uh, uh, meiosis one, which actually enters into the second meiotic division, uh, the metaphase two, uh, only when the OMI is neutralized. So neutralization of OMI and initiation of meiosis two arrested at metaphase. This occurs three hours before ovulation. Now, there is rapid increase in the follicular fluid volume, and this is mainly under the influence of progesterone. And there is a, a, a inflammatory reaction taking place uh, uh, due to the secretion of LH and progesterone, uh, inflammatory reaction because of the uh, uh, pro progesterone induces the uh, prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase, the enzyme, and thus the prostaglandins E and F, leukotriene, thromboxin A2, these are all secreted and there is a pseudo-inflammatory response before the rupture of the follicle. Besides this prostaglandins, LH, FSH, they also activate the uh, enzymes like plasmine, collagenase, lysosomal enzymes and helps to develop a small bulge on the wall of the follicle which is known as sigma and this bulge actually ruptures a small opening hole occurs due to the uh, um, lytic enzymes and subsequently it enlarges and there is ovulation that is uh, um, uh, the uh, ovum can be expelled and the FSH induces the detachment of the cumulus oophorus and so that the secondary oocyte along with the corona radiata and the sona pellucida can be expelled. But for the expulsion, a muscular contraction is required. This is done by the prostaglandin F2 alpha and also oxytocin. They induce this thickal muscle contraction and finally expulsion of oocyte. So this is the uh, expulsion of oocyte we see that there is initially an uh, inflammatory reaction. Subsequently, there is muscle contraction, contraction of the thickal muscle cells under the influence of prostaglandin and oxytocin. And last but not the least, there is tissue remodeling. That is the tissues, the granulosa cells uh, and the thickal cells which are left behind is now going to form the corpus luteum. So now there is formation of corpus luteum. Here we find that once the uh, um, oocyte is being expelled, there is a blood filled cavity. There is a healing of the um, 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 ovarian wall, but we find that there is a blood filled cavity which is known as corpus hemorrhagicum. And this corpus hemorrhagicum finally. Uh, uh, or organizes itself to form the corpus luteum. This corpus luteum, we see that they have mm, a, a large uh, cholesterol deposits, so it is yellowish in color, and um, uh, it is actually acting as an endocrine organ. Here, the um, uh, leftover, the granulosa cells and the thecal cells they we find they will organize themselves. Hmm. Uh, um, the thickal cells are known as the thickal luteal cells and the granulosa cells. They will undergo hypertrophy and arrange themselves in rows and now the basal lamina disappears. So the two cell theory is no more there. That is two cells are not being separated by basal lamina and there are the uh, VEGA vascular endothelial growth factors, fibroblast growth factors which causes the rapid growth and vascularization of corpus luteum. This formation of corpus luteum is known as luteinization. And so the corpus luteum is formed and as I told you, it acts as a new endocrine unit secreting both estrogen and progesterone. And if there is pregnancy, it is the site for uh, secretion of human chorionic gonadotrophin as well. But if there is no fertilization or pregnancy does not occur, then corpus luteum begins to regress after about uh, seven to eight days. 
and this process is called luteolysis. So by 14th day, there is complete uh, apoptosis and necrosis of the um, uh, corpus luteum and now it forms only a scar on the ovarian surface which is called the avascular scar which is known as the corpus albicans and uh, uh, this will uh, regress the hormone secretion so there is sudden withdrawal of the estrogen and progesterone hormone actually due to the estrogen progesterone there was negative inhibition of fshlh but estrogen progesterone was high but once the luteolysis occurs the estrogen progesterone suddenly drops and the corpus luteum is still uh, uh, sorry the uh, fshlh is still not there so what happens that there is menstruation this is the endometrial cycle this is we see the endometrial cycle which is occurring where we see that initial uh, uh, one to five day is the menstrual flow because at the end of secretory phase we see that there is large blood vessels large uh, glycogen laden gland and sudden drop of this estrogen progesterone cannot actually support this huge bulk of endometrium so what happens there is sloughing of the um, um, upper layer of the upper two third of the um, uh, 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 this is called the stratum functionally actually this is the stratum basalis this is the stratum basalis we see and above it there is stratum functionally now the stratum basalis is supplied by basal blood vessels and the functionally by the corkscrew-like uh, 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 spiral blood vessels. Now, this spiral blood vessels, as they are corkscrew-like, they uh, actually undergoes rhythmic spasm under the influence of PGF2 alpha prostaglandin. And this rhythmic spasm, along with the sudden drop in the hormone level, will uh, um, uh, is unable to support the proliferated endometrium. So it undergoes ischemic necrosis, there is stromal shrinkage as well, and the compression of blood vessels uh, uh, leads to ischemic necrosis of the superficial layer or the stratum functionally of the um, endometrium, which undergoes sloughing. And this is the menstruation, which uh, um, um, persists for one to five days. And then there is gradual proliferation because by this time, FSH and LH starts rising as there is a drop of estrogen progesterone, no more negative feedback. So under the influence of this follicle stimulating and the LH hormone, we see there is the proliferative phase. The spiral arteries, they grow larger, the glands started growing, and this is the reparative phase from this sloughing of the endometrium so that the from the basal level the functional level it develops and uh, after the proliferative phase in the secretory phase the rate of growth may be slower but we find that the arteries become highly spiral and the glands they become tortuous and they are now laden with this blue colored glycogen because they have to feed the implanted embryo if the um, uh, pregnancy occurs. So secretory phase is actually the phase for the preparation for um, uh, reception or implantation and subsequently um, uh, the uh, pregnancy of a, um, a woman's life. So the proliferative phase is a reparative phase and secretory phase is actually the um, uh, phase when there is development of the uh, um, uh, infrastructure for the subsequent pregnancy to come. We'll discuss the hormonal changes uh, afterwards. So uh, along with the ovarian changes, we see that there are the endometrial changes as well in due to the menstrual cycle. Now, changes in the other organs also occur. Uh, I'll not mention all of them. Just we'll uh, know about the changes in cervix mainly. In the proliferative phase, we see that the cervical mucosa is very, uh, uh, mucus secretion is a very thin, watery type. And it is copious and alkaline in nature. Because if you remember, the prosthetic semen was alkaline in nature. And this promotes the sperm survival and transport. 
the mucus is thin and elastic type and it can be stretched very long up to even 8 to 12 centimeters and fine threads and this is called spin bucket test positive. So if you can draw long threads then spin bucket is positive. Now this this mucosa, if uh, mucus secretion, if you spread on a slight thin glass slide and allow to dry it, then you'll see the characteristic fern-like pattern. Okay, this is called the fern test positive. So these all occurs during the proliferative phase of the um, uh, cervix, cervical mucosa. Now in secretory phase, due to the progesterone effect, we see that the cervical mucus now becomes very scanty less in amount very thick tenacious cannot be drawn into um, uh, threads neither can show the ferning pattern so this change from the proliferative phase to secretory phase is in the proliferative phase this alkaline nature and this watery uh, um, uh, copious uh, uh, secretion they all helps in the sperm survival and motility but once the sperm has entered there is a uh, um, uh, Fertilization, no more sperm uh, is required to enter. So now the progesterone changes the characteristic of the cervical mucosa. There are several changes in vagina, etc. But in the fallopian tubes, we see that the ciliary changes are uh, more so that uh, the sperm can move during the proliferative phase. But in secretory phase, this is lost. And in breast tissue, we find that the estrogen mainly helps in the development of the breast ducts and ductules, whereas the progesterone helps in the development of lobules and alveoli. Now, so the signs and symptoms of ovulation, if we come to, then we see that the body temperature increases. Body temperature increases during the uh, ovulation that is one to two days after ovulation we'll see that 0.5 degree rise in temperature occurs if a woman uh, measures the digital thermometer uh, just before rising then he'll she'll see that there is 0.5 to 1 degree rise in temperature basal body temperature bbt it is called because of the thermogenic effect of progesterone then comes mittels mars mittels mars is nothing but the uh, um, mid uh, um, uh, cycle pain. It's a German term which tells us about a mid cycle uh, pain or middle pain which occurs in 20% of the women. And lastly, the cervical mucosal changes, uh, uh, as we have already said. There is uh, a decrease uh, 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 in the amount of uh, secretion, uh, becomes thick, vicious, tenacious. Um, um, and there is no watery secretion um, after ovulation due to progesterone effect, cannot be stretched, so spin bar kit is negative, farming pattern is lost, and the alkaline pH is lost as well. Now, then we'll come to a few of the abnormal ovarian functions. Now, there may be primary ovarian failure, that woman never ovulates and never experiences a menstruation, or there may be a secondary ovarian failure, that is the Menstruation occurs normally in these individuals for years, but stops prematurely, that is, before 40 years of age. Then it is called the secondary ovarian failure. Now, few causes of primary ovarian failure. Now, genetic causes, we have known Kalman syndrome, that is, from the neural placode, the GnRH neuron, and the olfactory neurons that develop. So, these uh, um, patients have um, anosmia along with uh, non-development of GnRH neuron, so they are hypogonadotrophic, hypogonadism. Then sex chromosomal abnormalities like Turner's X0 or Fragile X, even though XX is there, but they do not uh, um, uh, help in development of the normal female gonads. Then McCune Albright syndrome, this we have already discussed, they have precocious puberty, but due to the galactoria increased prolactin, there is amenorrhea in these patients and ovarian failure. Then there are several endocrine causes, mainly the failure of the HPG axis. Um, and uh, one of the very important causes is hyperprolactinemia, uh, the galacto, uh, galactoria, as I told you, in Matthew and Albright. Then PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. In this also, we have a ovarian failure. Then androgen receptor 
uh, insensitivity for the gonadotrophic receptor insensitivity or the GnRH receptor insensitivity. We see although the level of gonadotrophin releasing hormone or LHFSH is normal, but the um, uh, gonadal uh, um, uh, development uh, uh, is not normal. And um, last but not the least, there may be enzyme deficiency like aromatase or that is CYP19 or CYP17 abnormality. So these are the causes of primary ovarian failure. These patients have uh, uh, never uh, have the menses. So this is also a cause of primary amenorrhea. Then the secondary ovarian failure. Here we see that the premature ovarian failure before the 40 years of age. 1% uh, of the 40-year-old woman um, faces this. There may be follicular depletion or maybe follicular dysfunction. Follicular depletion may be because of chemotherapy due to any other cause if abdomen is uh, abdominal chemotherapy or radiation therapy is given, then there is follicular depletion. Then X chromosomal abnormality if there is, then definitely the gonads do not develop, follicles cannot develop. Then autoimmunity towards the follicular development. In all these, there is accelerated atresia so that the female um, uh, undergoes ovarian failure before 40 years of age. Because after 40 years of age, it will be menopause. The female finally, once they will have a cessation of ovarian function. But before 40 years of age, if it occurs, then it is a premature ovarian failure or secondary ovarian failure. That who are having normal ovarian function is now depleted or follicular dysfunction, autoimmunity is one of very important cause. Enzyme deficiencies we have seen, but enzyme deficiency may not be uh, um, um, uh, uh, presented uh, um, right from birth, maybe a few years after they present. Then the receptor abnormalities we have said, they will also present with a premature ovarian failure. But in most cases, the etiology is unknown. So if we come to the etiology, one is iatrogenic, that is if they are given the gonadometrophin uh, analog uh, or in contraceptive pills, then definitely the um, um, due to the raised estrogen progesterone level, the FSH LH won't work. So they will have a uh, ovarian failure. That is one of the cause. Then idiopathic, as we have said, most of the patients are idiopathic. Some of the infections like tuberculosis is one of the very important ovarian infection that may lead to ovarian failure. Autoimmunity is very, very important like that of autoimmune thyroiditis, autoimmune Addison's disease. Similarly, ovarian failure may be also due to autoimmune diseases. And among the environmental causes, there may be radiation, there may be trauma, there may be surgery, there may be causes like stress. And uh, uh, genetic causes sometimes may lead to secondary. Genetic causes more commonly uh, for the primary ovarian failure, but some of the secondary ovarian failure may be due to it. Now, the diagnosis of premature ovarian failure is FSH should be more than 40 uh, micro uh, international units per ml. That is the criteria uh, um, um, uh, that FSH has gone up and the estrogen has gone down. And the uh, patient will clinically have sustained amenorrhea along with infertility and the hot flushes like the menopausal or perimenopausal syndrome. The age should be less than 40 years because after 40 years, maybe it is perimenopausal phase it has started. Then a number of primordial follicles have undergone accelerated atresia or impaired, that is follicular dysfunction. This is often overt in the ultrasonography or biopsy. And the estrogen should be less than 50 picomole per liter. So if the estrogen level is very low, FSH is high with the clinical features of menopausal or perimenopausal syndrome, age is below 40 years and the ultrasound or the biopsy shows the features of um, uh, follicular atresia or follicular dysfunction, then we may diagnose it as the premature ovarian failure. Now coming to amenorrhea. Amenorrhea is absence of menses during the reproductive years. That is between say uh, 14 to 40 years. Not and definitely before nine years when there is the puberty has not uh, started or not after 40 years, maybe menopause has uh, set in. So this category of uh, women, if they have absence of menses, then we will call it amenorrhea. 
Now, so amenorrhea is actually the um, 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 symptom presented due to ovarian failure, isn't it? It may be primary, it may be secondary. Similarly, so amenorrhea can be also primary and secondary. So primary amenorrhea is the absence of uh, menses by the age of 14 with the absence of growth and development of secondary sexual characteristics. So these patients, you see, they have never uh, um, um, undergo menstruation um, because beyond 14 years, it is even not delayed puberty and they have not developed secondary sexual characters. So here we see that there must be the failure of uh, uh, gonadal hormones and the gonad itself so that there is no male. But there may be absence of menses after 16 years with normal sexual development. So here the gonadal hormones are coming normally, but due to any cause or other, there is absence of mens. So these are two categories of primary amenorrhea. And in secondary amenorrhea, when will you call it secondary amenorrhea? Because they were regulatory mens menstruating. So if they consequent three cycles, they miss, or they uh, for six months, they are not having a menstruation, uh, in a woman who is previously menstruating regularly, then she is called as having secondary amenorrhea. So in primary amenorrhea, we see that 14 years of age, up to 14 years of age, without any secondary sexual characteristic, they have, uh, may have uh, absence of mens or no menstruation 16 years with normal sexual development. And in the secondary amenorrhea, it should be uh, um, uh, at least three cycles they should have missed or uh, uh, more than six months they are not having menstruation. But here you have to rule out the pregnancy, the lactational amenorrhea as well because in lactation, the prolactin is high, FSH, LH will be low. So they may have uh, amenorrhea and if there's hysterectomy, definitely there is no, 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 uh, uh, no menses. And then pre and post prepubertal or postmenopausal ages should also be considered. Now the causes of primary amenorrhea. There may be structural causes like imperforated hymen, vaginal atresia, mullerian agenesis like this. So here you will see that this group is that coming uh, uh, that with a uh, amenorrhea up to 16 years of age but with normal sexual characteristics because their gonad is normal their hormones are coming normally but what has happened due to the structural defect they cannot menstruate okay now the genetic causes are there uh, chromosomal abnormality gonads had not developed Kalman syndrome, they have uh, precocious puberty. Here we see that their puberty is early, but they cannot menstruate because um, uh, GnRH pulse is not secreted normally, androgen insensitivity, so there is hormonal defect. Then in endocrine, we have failure in the HPG axis. These have no, usually no secondary sexual development. In PCOS, they have the androgen excess. So these patients may have uh, 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 sexual development because um, uh, estrogen is present, but androgen is in excess. But in patients with hyperprolactinemia, they have also the normal um, uh, estrogen. So they have the secondary sexual characteristics. But at the same time, because of the hyperprolactinemia or androgen excess, they uh, do not have normal uh, uh, menses. Now the causes of secondary amenorrhea in short, hypothalamic or pituitary causes of that, the physiological causes, pregnancy, lactation. Then stress may inhibit the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Even exercise, very severe exercise in um, um, athletes, they may delay the uh, menses. Pathological radiation, tumor trauma, then ovarian failure, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, we have already discussed. Then coming to the uterine causes, the TB endometriosis, surgery, radiation, Asherman syndrome is very common. Uterine addition due to TB endometriosis, addition, so no menses, although the hormones are normal and the drug-induced oral contraceptive pills having either estrogen or a combination pill of estrogen progesterone. So here, the FSH LH levels is kept low. So normal LH surge is not there, normal ovulation is not there. So they are undergoing amenorrhea. And GnRH analog, if it's given, then also they will have the secondary amenorrhea. Now, some other menstrual abnormalities like menorrhagia. So usually, the menstrual period lasts for one to five days usually three to five days and normal amount is about 30 ml blood loss, mainly venous loss, venous blood is lost. Now, if they have more than seven days 
uh, a bleeding and a, a 80 ml or more uh, uh, bleeding in a uh, episode then this is called hemorrhagia excessive bleeding for excess duration metrorrhagia that is in between the cycle is 28 days or uh, 26 days but uh, in the um, uh, 12th day 10th day there is a, a repeated uh, uterine bleeding so this is metrorrhagia menometrorrhagia uh, at the same time there is repeated bleeding and the bleeding is more duration is more throughout the month the woman is bleeding and becoming anemic polymenorrhea uterine bleeding the cycle is uh, uh, very short more than 21 days commonly 20 21 days is the least so if it is less than 21 days then we call it polymenorrhea in a uh, month they may have twice bleeding oligomenorrhea very less and the cycle is um, very long 35 days or more and amenorrhea we have said absence of uterine bleeding and in secondary amenorrhea it should be six months or longer and last few words about premenstrual syndrome cyclic occurrence of this symptom that is physical emotional psychological manifestation before uh, um, ovulation that is five to seven days sorry before menstruation before menses and usually subsides by four days after onset age is between 25 to 45 years mostly in the perimenopausal period these symptoms are more aggravated these are called the premenstrual uh, symptom of pms and 75 to 85 percent women, uh, women have only one symptom we'll discuss uh, the symptoms only one symptom uh, 85 uh, percent of women 20 to 30 percent moderate serious syndrome and in three to five percent stabilitating that is they uh, impaired the lifestyle so what are the common peri uh, uh, premenstrual syndrome uh, you uh, find a list of them of which the uh, headache and mood swings are very common food craving even binge eating or uh, um, uh, less eating low energy level is there and there is a feeling of depression feeling sadness hopelessness uh, um, uh, unable to concentrate and definitely sleep disturbances these are the common symptoms of pms so we'll end the class today to summarize we know that um, it is the menstrual cycle that is the main cyclical change which occur in a reproductive life of a female every month and uh, under the influence of hormone both the gonadotrophs from pituitary and the gonadal estrogen progesterone that there is cyclical changes in all the organs uh, of female reproductive organs but mainly it is the ovary and the uterus which goes in conjunction one producing the ovum secreting the hormones and the other preparing itself for the implantation and nurturing of the embryo so this entire cycle which comes every month in a, a life of female is uh, uh, in a preparation for pregnancy and if there is absence of uh, this menstrual cycle we call it amenorrhea and this is usually due to the ovarian failure maybe primary that the uh, uh, woman never have menstruated or a normally menstruating uh, female before the onset of menopause before 40 years of age if she or he suddenly stops menstruating for more than six months then these are called the primary or the secondary amenorrhea and we have listed certain causes and premenstrual this rise in progesterone this elite surge these hormonal changes these leads to certain uh, uh, symptoms which are known as premenstrual symptoms occur uh, two to three days before menstruation and uh, by four days after menstruation it is gone so we'll end our class uh, uh, today and in the next class we'll discuss in details about the hormonal changes occurring with the menstrual cycle thank you very much thank you everybody